I'm Matthew Phelps, co-author of the Turning to God's Word Bible Study, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, the Faithful Witness. Today we'll be talking about Lesson 8 of our study, which covers the book of Revelation, Chapter 7. Intro! At the end of the previous lesson and chapter, we were on quite a cliffhanger. We had, you've got these seven seals, which are supposed to be and are a huge deal, uh, bringing about the end of all things, and we broke six of them. And we stopped, um, just as chapter break, but still we stopped. Uh, big cliffhanger. We dealt with pretty much all of the things, in summary, that are incompatible with the coming of the presence of God. And we did not touch on those people who are compatible with the presence of God. It seems now, as we move into this lesson, that before we get to that last seal, we do also have to address the people who are compatible with the coming and the presence of God. So that is our change in focus in this chapter and this lesson. We will see Interestingly, that those people are in two categories, very interestingly, and we'll talk about it. Uh, in summary, uh, you can argue you have Jews and Christians, various types of people who um, inherit the promise of God in different ways. Uh, and we'll see how that plays out and what it looks like a little bit. Um, there's a lot of, this is one of The whole book of Revelation has a long history of being badly interpreted and a lot of weird ideas floating around out there. We just talked about the so-called four horsemen of the apocalypse and none of them is ever treated as Jesus, for example. So this is not uniquely a thing that is messed up, but it is a thing that is messed up because uh, you've got a couple different types of groups of people and they tend to get lumped together or conflated or just confused. Um, so hopefully by the end of going through this study, um, you can have a good sense for these two groups of people and what that means here at the end of time as we're gathering together the people who are in line with the kingdom of God before we can do whatever happens with that last seal. Here we see building on an idea that was important in the last chapter. Um, the earth has four corners. I mentioned that they viewed it that way when we were suggesting that the earth could be seen as an altar. Um, this is reinforcement of that idea. Uh, you've got, here at the four corners of the earth, you've got four angels um, holding back the winds. Um, really, so we're fixing a lot of things, right? Uh, and we've talked about all of this tumult that is pending or happening. Here we're saying, oh, wait, wait, before, I know everything is braced and ready to tumult, um, and we're, and we're going to do that. But first, um, let's make sure we, we've got one more thing we've got to handle that's not seal related. Why is this not seal related? Because these are not the things that are incompatible with God. These are the things that are compatible with God. So they're not, they don't have a seal, right? You break a seal, you fix something that's not compatible with the coming of God. Here we're pausing that to instead handle something that is. So this is not a thing that needs a seal. Um, where does it fall? In the sequence of days or seals not days although we'll get to that um, between six and seven um, what happens in that point in time speaking of days in creation you have all of the things of the earth handled in, in creation handled in six days and then on the seventh day, humanity rests with God. 
We broke six seals and handled all of the things that were amiss uh, and out of whack on Earth. So when is this happening? Uh, between the sixth and the seventh seals. Um, if you look back to the creation of the world, what happens in the first six days, you're dealing with the earthly things, right? The act of creating all of the world. And then at that seventh point, at that seventh day, humanity rests with, is in unity with God. And then, you know, looking forward to an eighth day where that's really fulfilled uh, in Christ uh, and comes to its ultimate purpose. But in the context of creation, and those the six days are concerned with the things of the creation of the earth. As we're breaking these seals, we have had six day, six seals concerned with writing the wrongs of the things on the earth, um, undoing the things that are out of whack and getting them ready for something correct. We've been very much concerned with those earthly things. And now we are again at that point of about to be a seven thing and we're pausing to say, okay, let's, you know, it's very much in line with God's rest. It's let's find these people who are God's people and let's, before the happening happens, um, we'll get to that. We've got to make sure that we have accounted for um, these people who don't, again, get their own seal because they're not a thing that is out of whack. They're the thing that is in whack. I guess that's not really a phrase, but they're the thing that's correct. Um, and so we've just got to make sure that that is handled. Here we set up something pretty cool uh, that gets us back to putting together that puzzle from the Old Testament. Um, out comes another angel with the seal of the living God. Language can be hard. This is not the, the seal on the scroll, right? Like, it could have been the seal that sealed the scroll, but then you have a seal is two different things, right? One, it's the stamp. Right, you pour some wax on something and you stamp. The stamp is a seal. The thing that is left stamped that has the imprint on it is a seal. Um, so you have two things that can be called a seal. Um, we have been breaking the wax seals um, on the scroll, holding it together. Right, We've, there's one left. This is not the last of those seals. It could be the thing that stamped them. Um, it is for sure, what does that do, right? It puts a, an identifying mark in the thing that was intended to not be replicable, right? It could also be like a signet ring did the same thing uh, and was like your way of signing your name when people didn't really do that very much and you didn't have digital identification. It is a means of identification and potentially ownership. Um, and so God sealed, you know, you sealed the document that way because it was secret and you needed to know if anybody, uh, it needed to not be replicable so you knew if anybody opened it. You also signed documents that way, right? Like, I, here's my will, pow, uh, it's now illegal, whatever, stuff like that. Um, that's the seal that we're bringing out. We're bringing out the stamp that is God's, like, signature. Um, more or less. Um, so that's a big deal. Um, and we're, again, we're going to put off a little bit of this destruction, the, the culmination of this destruction, until we mark out some people. Um, where have we done that before? Um, the number is different, but there was once a series of uh, events that befell the people of Egypt 
that were very tumultuous. Um, not unlike some of the things we've been talking about, but also not entirely like. Um, and right before we got to the last one, uh, the one that really brought everything home, we paused and we made sure that the people who were God's people were set apart by a mark. It wasn't on the people at that point. It was <coughs> over their doors. So that when the plague came through, the angel of death, um, he, he could see the mark and say, nope, not this one, and pass over that house uh, in, of course, the Passover. Um, so that is one of the pieces we are here working with. The other one is the prophet Ezekiel promising that God's people will be marked. Um, and I suppose the third one could be the idea of baptism as we're marked as people of God as well. Uh, although that maybe muddies the waters of where we're going here with this first group of people a little bit. So let's stick with the Passover and Ezekiel as the primary images we're looking for and at. Um, and we are going to, before we bring this last part to pass, we are going to seal some people. Um, which people? Um, some out of every tribe of the sons of Israel, uh, 144,000. Um, who are the people out of every tribe of the sons of Israel? Um, I have said when I have talked about this, and I've been wrong when I've done it, that these are Jews. Um, Jews are a part of these people. This is all of the people of Israel. This is the people of God, um, whose tradition most notably still exists today in the form of Judaism, for sure. Um, and really you don't have much of non-Judaism practice or any that I'm aware of, of non-Judaism practice of the old religion of the Hebrew people. Uh, so practically speaking, it still pretty much is Jews, but it's important to note that you know Judaism extends from one segment of these people, but God made the promise to all. And here he is, it's the promise made way back. I will be your God and you will be my people. And the salvation implied, or not more than implied, the salvation guaranteed in that promise that is here being looked at. As when they were slaves in Egypt, God spared them from death from Pharaoh and delivered them through the Red Sea uh, safely on dry land when Pharaoh and all of his army drowned in the water. The promise that achieved that is still in effect now uh, and in the future. Um, God does not go back on his word. So there are people who, in, who are still claimants to that promise of God. Um, I will be your God and you will be my people. And as the end of times comes about, nothing has voided that promise. So it's a small, this is a symbolic number. We'll talk about it when we get to the tribes. This is not a huge number of people. Um, their history was about being a remnant. Um, and their end is about being a remnant. It's not easy to achieve salvation through being one of these people of God. It is much easier to achieve salvation through Christ. Um, that is the preferred and the recommended pathway. If you want to find your way to God, don't try to become Jewish, please, because of this part. We'll get to that. There's an easier, surer way. But it's not the only way. Um, there is an existing promise that comes before that of Christianity that is still in effect, um, which we'll get into when we talk about these tribes a little bit as well. Here we specify who's included in this 144,000. There are numbers always mean something more than numbers 
in the book of Revelation. We have 12 tribes and we have 12,000 from each of those tribes. Uh, I hope it's clear that this is symbolic and not like we're picking exactly 12,000 people from each of these tribes. Um, it's not a lot is one of the points to keep in mind. Um, and it is all ish, we'll talk about it in just a second, all of these people. Um, it's not just Judah and the Jews. Um, oddly, in the Old Testament, the listings of the 12 tribes are not always the same. In fact, they're frequently different. Uh, some of that is related to uh, you have Joseph and you have Ephraim and Manasseh, his sons, uh, who were half tribes and got a part of his inheritance. And so the, then you ended up with 14 and Levi, who might or might not, because they became the priests, might or might not be entitled to any sort of inheritance or listing in the tribes. Uh, and so between all of that, you have 14 names vying for a list that definitely has to be 12 long. Uh, and so depending on the politics of the time and the context of what you're talking about, right? If you're talking about the 12 sons, you have to include Levi and Joseph. If you're talking about who inherited land, um, then you take out Levi and Joseph and you include Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, if you start to muddy the waters with politics later on, then you start to mix and match, um, depending on who's in and out of favor. Uh, and what's going on in the broader world. So oddly, a thing that should be simple, what are the 12 tribes of Israel, is something that is not always the same. Um, so who do we and don't we have here becomes the question. We do have Levi. Um, we do have Joseph. Okay, so we're going to get, so we're just going with the 12 sons, right? No big deal. Um, except we do have Manasseh, one of Joseph's sons. Whoops. Um, what are we doing on this list? Now, to have Manasseh here, we, of course, have Joseph's other son, Ephraim. Nope. Uh, okay, that's a thing that happened. So we've got... But now we've got 13 and we've got 12 spots. So what else is going on? And we don't also have Dan. Um, Dan and Ephraim didn't make the cut. Um, why? So again, every time you get to one of these listings, you get to what is important about who constitutes the people of God. Um, and it depends on the views of the time. This is inspired by Revelation prophecy and is a reassembling of these things from the Old Testament up to and including we are reassembling the tribes that count. Um, and we're doing that on the basis of what they did. Um, these two, Ephraim and Dan, were the ones responsible for setting up centers of worship outside of the approved area of worship of God and introducing a, a much more formally idolatry into the people of especially the northern kingdom of Israel uh, and leading many, many people astray. Um, so what is important to God in this list, of course, you know, as we're looking at ending time and or re, or the world as we know it and you know marking people as belonging to god um you're not going to mark the people who were in blatant idolaters right they disinherited themselves from being people of god when they said we're going to set up different worship and worship other gods um 
it's as easy as that. Um, it's really interesting though, right? Um, because this is not a version that I am aware of of the list of the 12 tribes that exists in the Old Testament. And there are a lot of them, right? Like, again, it's not just like there's one or two versions of this in the Old Testament. There are different versions for different reasons, and this is not one of them. Uh, this is unique to here. Um, so it's what the book of Revelation does. It takes those pieces from the Old Testament and the reasoning behind them and what's going on, and it reassembles in the light of Christ uh, and in the light of prophecy and uses it to understand a thing that is yet to happen. Um, and we're doing that again. Uh, it's crazy to think that it could affect something even like the list of who are the 12 tribes, but it's fascinating when you see it. Um, so the key point is that there is, among this people who were always dealing in remnants, a remnant that are faithful to God and that are still the people of God. Uh, and that who, before God brings about the end of time, is going to mark as his people, right? Like, sign, their, sign his name, right? Like, Yahweh, Yahweh, whatever, seal, uh, mine. Uh, so that when whatever happens, happens, they don't get mistaken for not his. Why would there be any doubt? Because they're not Christian. The Christians, you don't have to seal because they're Christian. They have, they put Christians themselves, Christ's name on themselves, right? They have already signed themselves with God's name and God has endorsed that already, right? Like that's part of being a Christian uh, is like, it's in the name Christian, right? Like God's name is on me already. Um, like I've done that, but Jews don't have, or Hebrews, whatever, Israelites, for practical purposes, they are Jews, even though, strictly speaking, it's broader than that, have not marked themselves with God's name in the same way, right? The name of being a Jew is after the tribe, not after Yahweh. They're God. Um, they're God's people, but they're separated by degrees, and it's harder to... Clearly, there's the implication that there could be some confusion about whether these are people of God, and not all of them count. Um, we've seen not everybody who claims to be a Christian counts either, and we've seen some of what happens there. Uh, this is not unique to the Jews, that not everybody counts. Um, but not everybody counts. So we want to find those who count and make sure there's no mistaking that they count, so that when things happen, they get put into the bucket of this is one of God's, and not into the bucket of you don't want to be in that bucket. Um, so that's what we're doing here, um, and why we're doing it for these people and not for the Christians, because as Christians, we have already assumed being marked and called by God's name explicitly. This is where sometimes people get confused. After this, I looked. And behold, a great multitude, which no man could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. This is not the same group of people. Um, and it is vastly more plentiful. right? It's not 144,000 people. It is a great multitude. These are Christians. right? These are people who have come through the ordinary, accessible way to God. Um, and they're standing already before the throne of God. There was also kind of an implication that the 144,000 were still down on earth, not up in heaven, and were not maybe having joined this party yet. They're going to, but probably not yet. They're in different places. Um, and these are the ones in the presence of God uh, and singing a hymn to God um, and talking about salvation. Um, this is not a song of victory, which we saw and we'll see again uh, in the book of Revelation. This is just a song of praise. And the theme here is rightly with when this is happening, one of salvation, 
right? We paused to rampant destruction to make sure we're accounting for the people not being destroyed. Uh, and they're saying, we'll, we're so glad that we're saved. Uh, and kind of, get them, God. Uh, it's kind of, like, they seem to not have any concern at all about what's happening, and in fact, see even what's happening as an act of sal on the world, uh, as an act of salvation, right? Um, the word salvation means safety, by the way. Uh, so the people up in heaven, you know, the, this great multitude, they are safe and can rejoice in that. People down on earth, not so much. Um, now or in the future. We're wanting to get to a point where everyone is safe. Um, and that is forever. And that is the thing that we're doing um, as we're breaking these seals. So these people are not in danger of being caught. This group specifically is not in danger of being caught in what's going on on Earth. Um, we seem to have paused the action specifically to make sure the Jews on Earth got marked. And now we're just checking in with these other people in heaven who are saying, we're so glad we're safe. Um, isn't it good to be us? And they're right, it is. And that would be the ideal group to be in when all of this is coming to pass. Um, you know, to watch from safe distance in the bleachers, what's about to happen on the field would be just a fine place to be for this. And it would be very easy to cheer for your team uh, when you don't have to worry about injuries going on down on the field. Um, so they're very much cheering on God, um, which is a neat thing to see. As I'm reading this again now, I really am thinking about this, like you've got the earth, which is like, the football field where all the, the big games about to happen, right? And you're up here in heaven and you've got the audience, right? You've got your big crowd. Now you've got your elders that you saw before and angels and living creatures. You've got everybody uh, who was uh, previously mentioned up in heaven sitting in the bleachers cheering on what's about to happen. Right? They're not directly involved in the action, which makes it very easy to cheer, but they are also very much rooting for the victory that they are assured that God is about to win down on earth, which he is about to win down on earth. Uh, and so you've got, the, you've got a whole crowd in the audience cheering on what's about to happen. Uh, one other thing to mention about this hymn doesn't mention salvation, it mentions a lot of things. How many specifically things does it mention? Seven. Uh, ongoing theme, uh, which suggests that we've got a complete but an imperfect praise of God here yet, right? We don't get to, you don't have the real full spirited rejoicing in your team until you win the victory, right? Like, you might go hoarse and numb cheering on during the game, but you can't really completely celebrate until you won the victory and we're still playing the game. Uh, even if the outcome is assured, we're still playing the game. Uh, and they're cheering from the sidelines. Uh, different, slightly different focus, but the, the idea is just very much you have different groups cheering for different, cheering all for God's victory. Question 8, verses 13 and 14. Now we get a bit more clarification. We had this innumerable crowd, innumerable crowd, um, that were clearly in heaven and were pretty clearly Christians. Um, now one of the elders asks John, helpfully, who are these people that you don't know who they are? And John points out, you live here, I'm just visiting. Um, why don't you tell me? Uh, why are you asking me? Um, weird exchange, but, you know, a decent rhetorical advice, device is kind of funny. Uh, and it highlights that John is still here and out of his element, right? Like, John is, John doesn't know what's going on and is just seeing all of this and he needs dialogue with somebody to um, tee up 
what it is, so it works out just fine. Um, and who are they? These are they who have come out of the Great Tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Christians, right? More specifically, successful Christians. Uh, not just, these are the people who wore a cross and called themselves Christian. That was not the criterion here. It is who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. That's, we talked about it a lot in the last video, but I did kind of promise we'd talk about it in every video. Um, and it's surely bound to come up. Uh, being Christian requires more than calling yourself Christian. It requires coming to resemble God. Uh, separating yourself from the things of the world so that you can draw closer and closer to the things of heaven. Washing yourself in the blood of the Lamb, right? Before Christ, if you sinned, you were cut off forever from the possibility of inheriting eternal life with God. Now, you can sin and you can still obtain that salvation. But it is not, it is free in that it is offered to you and you don't have to pay for it. Um, but it has great cost. Um, it's just available for the taking. Uh, it's not restricted who has access. Uh, salvation is not a scarce resource. It is equally available to all people. But you do have to still do your part, or we do. I should definitely include myself in that. Um, it's not just there because you want it, right? Like you have to do, you still have, it's easier than impossible. That doesn't make it, like you get to do whatever you want and you still get the benefit of being one of the people of God. You have to live a Christian life. You have to be washed by the blood of the Lamb, which is you sin, Jesus Christ, through his suffering, death, and resurrection and blood, rights the wrong of that sin in your relationship with God, and you use that grace to grow closer to and to stay in union with God. Um, he didn't die so you can continue to live separately from God and call yourself a Christian, and that somehow is okay. You, The opportunity is there, the road, the way is there now to journey toward God and to restore to union what was lost in sin. Um, but you have to do it. Uh, you have to do your part. Um, it's not something to take for granted. Um, because it will never, just because that opportunity will never go away in the course of your lifetime, and it's avail no matter how many times you mess up, it's still there, doesn't mean it's not critically important to do your part. Uh, cannot emphasize that enough. Uh, there's an attitude of Christianity, especially in this country, but beyond as well, where the started probably more pro predominantly in forms of Protestantism, but definitely exists in our church today now as well, where I think of a line from Jesus Christ Superstar with this, right? Christ, you know I love you. Did you see I waved? I believe in you and God, so tell me that I'm saved. Um, the attitude is there, right? Like, I am saved, right? I can, I've, you know, made a public profession of I believe in Jesus and now I am saved and I can do whatever I want or I'm Christian and so you know I can live my life the way I want to. Um, the idea of this first group of people being sealed and signed by God as God's property is the same as being Christian, right? Those people are getting that first group of people is getting assimilated into the crowd by being similarly marked as belonging to God, as Christians are marked as belonging to God. You have to look like you belong to God to be Christian. Or, you know, you might not be passed over. And, you know, that death and tumult and plague and all of that might 
find its way to you. Uh, you're not tricking God, right? You're not, he loves you, but that doesn't mean you get into heaven when you don't live a Christian life. Uh, that's not how that goes. If you're fundamentally incompatible with the presence of God, you will not enter the presence of God. There would be no love and mercy in that. That would be horrible for you, uh, worse than hell. Uh, hell is the mercy for you if you are not disposed to enter the presence of God. Uh, there's no changing that rule. Um, it's better for you that than that God let you into heaven the way you are. That would be like the presence of God would not be tolerable to you. So it's not like God is going to repent uh, when you're dead and decide, oh, you know, he was really nice though. And like, I know he did all these bad things routinely until the moment of his death, but he's nice and I really love him. So I'm going to let him up into heaven anyway. Uh, and it'll be great. Like, that's not what happens. You are either, you've either washed yourself in the blood of the lamb and you are worthy to enter the presence of God and you do, or you aren't and you don't. The gift of Christ and Christianity is that you might be able to, um, whereas before you could not. Um, you will not if you don't give it literally everything you have. Um, cannot be overemphasized. It's not a thing, Christianity is not a thing to be behind anything else in your life. I was going to qualify that statement, but there's no need. It's not a thing to do at all if you're not going to do it first. Because um, it does ask sacrifices. It does have cost. And if you're not putting it first, then you're not going to get the benefit of those things. And you're still going to pay the price. You might as well live that fun, heathen lifestyle if you're not going to make Christianity the most important thing in your life. Don't do that. It's better to... It's better to be on that threshold and work on getting there than to just give up. Um, so really don't listen to that point that I said. But strictly speaking, if you never get past keeping Christianity second, third, fourth, fifth in your life, it's not going to get you where you're trying to go. Uh, and it's going to be a bad time. Uh, you need to first. God has to be first. Um, there, there's not a way around that. There's not. But this other thing God and then you and that'll be fine right there's not any version of that that is okay um, it's God first or kind of not at all um, we've got time to get there right? the world's not ending today most of us watching these videos hopefully all of us are have some time yet uh, to figure this out but use the time right don't assume I can just keep going uh, and everything will be, and then I'll figure it out, I'll fix it later, right? You never know when your time is up, uh, and it could be over, and you could be not ready, and then you could be in a really bad spot. Uh, you need to be ready now because you don't know how long you have. Uh, the world needs to try to be ready now because we don't know how long we have, right? Everything in the book of Revelation works on a macro and a micro level, right? It works on the level of this is the world, and it works on the level of this is me. Um, and both work simultaneously. So, rant over, get your act together. Jesus first uh, is the only way to make this work. We talk, as I just did, a lot about the cost of Christianity. Sometimes we don't spend enough time talking about the benefit and what we get. Here we see the reward. Um, Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night within his temple. First, most important reward, staying in the presence of God and worshiping him. Uh, again, to an earlier point elsewhere in these videos, if you don't find Sunday Mass an enjoyable thing, you're not going to enjoy heaven, 
right? That's your great reward, is to sit worshiping in the presence of God. If that's not a thing that is enjoyable to you, um, you're not ready. Um, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The, the sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. Uh, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Those things, having your needs met, uh, having no more suffering, sorrows, a hunger, thirst, um, affliction by the elements, all of those things are great, but those are secondary, right, to lingering forever in the presence of God. Um, that's the main reward, and those things are added bonuses that help to serve and reinforce that main reward of staying forever in the presence of God. Um, which is, we have again to look forward to at one point in heaven and at a more distant point here on earth as well. This has been an overview of Lesson 8 of the Turning to God's Word Bible Study, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, the Faithful Witness. For more information, consult our written study and visit us online at turningtogodsword.com.